Jesus is offering some uninvited advice. He challenges the people at the party to consider choosing lower places around the table. He challenges them, like, don't assume that you're the super special guest. There's probably more tension that filters around the table, right? I can imagine the Pharisees kind of making eye contact with each other, raising their eyebrows. Um, We don't know where Jesus is sitting, right? Is Jesus, like, in the best seat? Is he in the worst seat? (laughs) Um, Jesus has just called them out, called them out on things they hold dear, their their egos, their traditions, their exclusivity, um, things that we all tend to hold a bit preciously. Oh, but Jesus is not finished. (laughs) Then he turns to the host and says, when you throw a banquet, by the way, he's throwing a banquet right now, don't invite your friends like you did today, invite the poor. Awkward pause. They, they weren't using silverware, but if they were, this would be the moment where like, it would just go silent and you would hear like, the silverware hit the plates and that, that one person who wasn't paying attention, like, <sighs> Jesus is kind of rude. Maybe he's hangry, but it, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Right? Like, you know how there's some shows or movies that some of us love to watch, but some of us are like, I can't watch that because the characters are so awkward, it's like too painful to watch. I feel a little bit embarrassed as I think about what it would have been like to be at the table with Jesus here. I think I would have been, you know, kind of looking at Jesus like, no, (laughs) cut it out. He's a guest at the party, and he starts off by breaking the rules, by telling them where they should sit, and then he criticizes the host in front of everybody. Don't you know how to be a good guest, Jesus? And it's at this point that uh, a man at one side of the table Maybe it's to break the awkwardness. Maybe he just doesn't really know what else to say. I picture him kind of raising a glass and, you know, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Ha, <laughs> um, Maybe he was sitting in the worst seat at the table and he was like, cheers to that, Jesus. <laughs> um, and, and that kind of moment is what launches Jesus into telling this parable, a story that helps the listeners kind of lean in and listen more closely. And, and the story is that a, a guy throws a party, he sent out his save the date cards, and people said, yeah, I'll be there. And now it's the day, the food is ready, the table is set, the place cards are out, and suddenly the people who agreed to be there are ghosting him. Like Silas and Evie showed for us, they ripped up the invitations. And their excuses stink. The the one guy's like, I have to go see some land I purchased. I mean, the housing market right now is crazy, but nobody's buying houses that they've never even seen a picture of or gotten to do a FaceTime walkthrough, at least. Um, Same then, people weren't about buying land they had never seen. Um, Another guy says, oh, you know, I bought some oxen, um, 10 of them, in fact, and I need to go give them a whirl. Like, uh, as far as I know, I don't think you do that without seeing them first, right? Like, I'm not going to buy one car without giving it a test drive or at least kicking the tires a little bit. And it's not even a pressing situation that would require him to miss the party. And then there's the married guy who I think is just playing like a newlywed card, like, oh, I'm a newlywed, can't make it. <laughs> so when the servant comes back to tell the master who's throwing the party that these folks are ditching, the master is furious. The food's been prepared. They said they would be there. The party's been planned, and now these folks are bailing. It doesn't make sense. It's a really wonderful invitation they've been given. And the people said one thing, and now they're doing another. 
So he tells the servant to go round up more people. And the servant does. And he says, you know, compel them to come in. And compel here, it's not like drag them in, right? It's not force or coercion. Um, I, I think what the master is saying is like, hey, you're inviting people who are positionless. So they might need some reassurance that this isn't a prank and that they are indeed welcomed here. They have a place at the table. So why does the party thrower even want people to come? Why is he so concerned about this? Um, it all started, Jesus telling this story, by that one person kind of cheersing, let's get this kingdom of God party started. It's going to be great. And Jesus is throwing out another challenge around the table, questioning if this guy will really want to be at that party. Will he really follow through on the invitation that's to come? The picture that Jesus is painting is not like the party that Jesus is at, right? The banquet he's currently at is filled with a bunch of people who feel that they really deserve to be there. In God's economy, the banquet is full of people who are enjoying the unexpected generosity of God. So remember, when Jesus tells a parable, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. A few weeks ago, Ellie reminded us that parables are, are not about spoon feeding, but inviting folks to lean in. So as we listen to the parables that Jesus tells, we have to ask two questions each time. Who is Jesus talking to? And who are the listeners invited to identify with in the story? Um, so Jesus here is talking to the Pharisees. Who are they being invited to identify with? Not the poor and marginalized, not the host. That's, that's definitely God. Um, so that leaves that they're either invited to identify with those who have backed out of the invitation or the only character left is the servant. Much like the Pharisees around the table that day, we also like to belong in places. Um, we want to feel community, and often it can be about what it's going to do for us, how it will make us feel. Uh, we sit at the end of our table sometimes, like that man holding up our glass, thinking, this is so nice, and won't it be nice someday in God's kingdom with all my St. Mo's friends? And meanwhile, Jesus is saying, hey, scoot over. Make room for more. I can identify with the Pharisees more than I really like to admit. I still fall into believing that my efforts will earn me a good seat at God's table. Um, and, and when I start to go into that thinking, it's like Jesus reminds me, looks at me with love. Judy, I'm really glad you're here. Now move down. <laughs> it's hard to scoot over and make room for others. I used to think I was good at it, <laughs> but I've learned that I still have quite a ways to go. A few years ago, I was invited to be part of a cohort that InterVarsity was hosting to develop women leaders within the organization. And we learned skills, we had mentors, we experienced spiritual formation. It was so good. Um, during one of the gatherings, and we, we were you know, coming from all over the country, during one of the gatherings, uh, we were focusing on feedback, learning how to receive feedback and give feedback. And it was so like artfully woven throughout the rest of the training. Um, in my little triad, we had to give a presentation um, to everyone there. And there were like vice presidents there and just the other women in the cohort who I really respected and um, wanted to think I was a good leader. So our team planned our presentation and got up to give it. And, uh, you know, we decided who would say which parts. So I said my part and our other teammates said theirs. And then the third person, Jen, it was her turn. And she said a few things and then she took a long pause. And I was like, oh, no. Jen forgot. We were going to say that one thing, and it was really important, and our presentation is going to get messed up. So I, I helped her out. You know, I, like, rescued her in that moment and, and said the, the closing remarks that we had. 
And afterwards, we gathered in our group for feedback. And I was taking it really seriously. I had like planned my feedback for everybody. I felt good about it. Um, and so when it came time for Jen to receive feedback, I was like, Jen, you're so wise. You're such a good leader. You have so many good things to say and bring into the world. But during our presentation, you were quiet and you held back and you didn't trust yourself. And, and she kind of gave me a strange look and then this sort of like care, look of care washed over her face. And she said, yeah, I know, Judy. Um, I didn't speak up because you stepped in and took over my part. <laughs> oh, it was a painful moment of realizing my own unwillingness to scoot over. Um, in the midst of a cohort designed to make room <laughs> for people, I was boxing out another woman. <sighs> for those of you in the tension of this moment with me, Jen and I had lots of opportunities to reconcile, and we're all good. She's been very gracious, and uh, we've gotten to work together. She, she lives in another part of the country, but we've gotten to work together on a couple things. Um, but it stuck with me. In fact, I even felt a little bit nervous to share the story here today because I was like, what if I tell this and someone is like, oh yeah, I've been elbowed out by Judy too, it sucks. <laughs> um, it's something that I'm still learning um, and something that I'm still needing to be attentive to. Jesus was warning the Pharisees at this meal that if they kept throwing parties like this, parties where they're exclusive, even among each other, trying to box each other out, parties where they can't even look up from their own spot to see somebody suffering right beside them, then they were not going to be prepared to even show up for the feast that God was preparing. If I don't reflect on the invitation that Jesus is giving me to transformation, to use my elbows to make space for others and not myself, I too will be in danger of not being prepared to show up for God's feast. But that day, Jesus was offering more than just a warning. He was offering invitation. There was another way to consider being. Instead of throwing elbows to make room for themselves, they could consider living like the servant, compelling others to come on in, offering their seat, their spot at the table. Yeah, it's true, you've been invited, and there's plenty of food, and actually nothing would make the host happier than to have you there at the table. The Pharisees, us, we're invited to be people like this servant who already know what the heart of the host is and are out inviting people in. When we're part of God's family, we don't take the best seats at the table. We don't go first in line and fill up our plates with food. We make room to listen for God so that we can hear when God says, okay, family, hold back. <laughs> Make some room. The banquet is absolutely for you. But it's not only for you. Let's make sure others get in here too. And maybe as you're sitting here, you have really, um, you've had experiences of Jesus inviting you to a table that you never thought you'd be welcomed to. I'm glad you're here. And maybe you feel more like uh, a Pharisee that's getting, you know, someone getting nudged out of the table um, as a self-proclaimed frequent elbow thrower. I'm sorry. But maybe you've been like the Pharisees and been a little too focused on your own place, your status, your comfort to notice who's not at the table the Pharisees didn't even notice that sick and swollen man 
on the outskirts who was suffering. So who's not here with us today? In person, on Zoom? Um, who's not at the table? It's okay to kind of shift in your seat if you want to look around a little bit. It's kind of hard to tell with masks on, like, who's here and who's not. This isn't like an attendance moment, right? It's, it's who's missing? Uh, who, who have we failed to invite in? Um, some, some, it might not be so obvious, and it, it, sometimes it might be very obvious, right? As we, as we look around and notice what... Um, ages, what ethnicities, what sexualities, what nationalities, what socioeconomic classes are here and, and not here? How can we be people who rearrange our seats so we can make room for more at God's table? We only have so many words <laughs> of Jesus recorded Right? So we can assume that having a record of Jesus talking about this, it's, it's important. Um, Jesus kind of like three or four times in this part of Luke is saying, make more room. It's something that God cares enough about that he might even want to say something to us about it today. So I'm going to pray for us. And as I do, I'm going to leave a few moments of quiet and invite God to speak to us. Um, now, if you are unfamiliar with a practice like this of listening for God, you might just, um, like a word might come to mind or maybe even a person, maybe a song or an image. And it's good just to say like, God, is this from you? And, and usually it just kind of feels like a, like a soulful nudge from God to pay attention. Um, so it's okay if it's new to you or feels a little bit uncomfortable. I'll keep an eye on the time. It'll just be for like a minute of quiet listening in the midst of the prayer. So will you pray with me? Jesus, would you speak to us about who you are asking us to scoot over for? God, would you help us to believe that you have your eye on the whole and that us scooting over doesn't mean that we miss out on any part of life with you? If there are places that we need to pull our own vision back and up so that we can see with your eyes, would you help us to? We don't want to be people who miss out on your party. We want to be prepared, and we want to bring others in too. So God, if there's something that you want to say to us about that, would you do it now? Let's just take a moment of quiet. that you speak to us in your word and through your word and through your spirit. Isaiah 25 says, In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. In that day, the people will proclaim, This is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is our Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Lord, would you show us who else and how to make more room at the table so that more people can proclaim that you are our God who we trusted and who saved us. Amen. I want to invite you, if you heard anything from God or even think maybe you heard something from God, um, if you would pull out your phone and open up Slack and the prayer channel in there and share because um, God might be doing something among us as a community that we should pay attention to. And if God is just inviting you personally to something, this is a great community to, to have some like accountability and to ask people to pray for you that you would respond to God's invitation and be obedient. Um, if you are not on Slack and need to be, you can put your hand up and I'll, I'll come find you and help you do that. But I'm going to invite the worship team that's coming up next. Or Ken? Okay. Thanks. <laughs>